welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. It's been two weeks since our last episode, and so there have been a bunch of potential things to talk about, but what I want to talk about today is re-engineering routines. And I'll, I'll do it by talking about two recent experiences that I've had with challenges to my routines and then how I've dealt with them, and then I'll talk about some of the broader principles involved. Now, some number of episodes ago, I did an episode on engineering your life routines, or something very close to that was the title, and that was talked a lot about how I'm a big believer in routines and how they can be very powerful and how we can make routines that give us a high probability of getting us good results sustained over time. And without routines, it can be easy to get bad results or certainly not the results that we want. Now, one thing that's interesting about routines is that under a certain set of conditions, they can become very ingrained. And then when the conditions change, they can disappear quite easily. And that's what I found in the past several months when I had a couple of big changes in my life. So one was um, my girlfriend and I moved apartments and we just moved about a mile south down the road in Laguna Beach, but to a, uh, to a bigger place. And But that was a little bit farther away from the beach, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then also getting a dog in the last several months. And the dog might not surprise you, but maybe the moving would in terms of I was shocked by how much just moving locations disrupted my routines until I really acknowledged it and then recreated or re-engineered the routine. So the with the new place, just to give you a sense of, of the differences between the new place and the old place, and the big issue was how often I go to the ocean. So I've talked about on this show, I'm a big fan of going in the ocean. I've engineered a lot of my life to be near the ocean. It's basically my favorite place. And I just find it very rejuvenating to go to the ocean to go in the ocean on a regular basis. And when I lived in my old place, it was very, very close to the ocean. It was probably 50 steps or 40 steps on the stairs. So you basically just, I would just go out my door, walk 15 feet, turn left, go downstairs, and then I would open a door, go down 40 stairs or so, open a door, and then I would be out on a beach, and then the the sand on that beach was quite close to the water. It was unusually close to the water. It might be... You know, 30 feet, 40 feet from the water. So, you know, in a minute I could get down to the beach. So it was just super easy. If I had the inclination to go to the beach, I could just go to the beach. Now the new place is by just about every standard, very close to the beach. It's on the beach side of the highway. So I don't have to cross uh, any lights, uh, but there's a kind of longish driveway, which might be, I've never counted it, but let's say it's like 400 feet. And it's, it's a pretty steep driveway. So it ends up taking, it sounds like maybe it's a little longer than that, but it's, it seems like it's very close, but it ends up being, um, to get to the beach. Oh, and the other thing is that the beach is much, the beach I'm on now is much bigger than the older one. And so the distance between the entering the beach and then being in the water is at least a hundred feet. And that sand on the new beach is quite a bit. I think it's finer. It's it's the old sand was very packed down, so I could just get on the beach and just run toward the water and go right in, whereas this sand is harder to walk through. And all these things, it can sound trivial and it can sound like, oh, complaining, oh, I'm not 50 feet away anymore, I'm 500 feet, and uh, what a tragedy that is. But it's not that at all. It's not complaining, and I'm, I'm happy to be in the new place. But what was noticeable to me was how much, without without any kind of re-engineering, this was disruptive to me. And the other thing, so the, the big things were it ended up being five minutes to get to the water versus one minute. And then also I didn't know the beach nearly as well. So I didn't know the wave patterns. I didn't know the bottom of it. And so I had some fear around how often, like how comfortable am I going to this beach? And I saw, I went down once or twice and it seemed like, oh, these waves are pretty big and I don't know it. And thus I felt uncomfortable going in and I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll walk to a nearby beach that's calmer. But then that walk was 
seven or eight minutes. And so what I realized happened maybe a month ago or so, I noticed my, my sister Catherine was visiting me and I, she wanted to go to the beach and I realized I've barely been going to the beach at all. I used to go every day or even multiple times a day. And I've just gotten out of the habit of it because it's, it's, there are just all these little friction points. It takes a little bit longer. The sand is longer. It's, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm going to be safe. And there were probably some other things too, but it was just, it seemed like nothing. You know, you still live on Laguna Beach right near the beach. And yet my habits had just completely changed. This this routine that I loved of going to the ocean, I just wasn't doing. And then when Catherine came, it sort of forced me to start figuring out the area better. So we went to a couple of the different beaches and I got a sense of how long do those take? And then soon after she left, I decided, okay, I'm going to try. I realized, oh, I need to go. I want to go, I should say, every day. And then I got in the habit just of with her, she was there three days in a row. And so I went three days in a row and that got me enough in the groove of it where it started overcoming the friction. And then I went down to the beach right near my place and I got in that and then I started learning that. And then even more what happened is I realized, okay, with, with my routine, there are ways of, there were ways of shaving off the time. And one was that I usually would go to, I would go to jujitsu class. I'd go spar for half an hour at from one to one thirty, And then I would, uh, my assistant would drive me home. So I'd get home maybe one forty five maybe a little bit later if, if class went long. And then I could walk out right to the beach of the old place, whereas this this place had this additional walking. And because I needed I often need to start work by two thirty at the latest, it would start to be borderline whether I could even um, make it there. So I just had it that well, he would drive me down that driveway and drive me back up, which can seem incredibly lazy, but given my schedule, it worked super well. So now it just takes a minute to get down. And now, and I go there straight from jujitsu and then I'm just right on the beach where it takes a minute to get right back up. And so what that did is it allowed me to have my same hour and a half lunch break and have jujitsu and a little meditation or rest and going into the ocean and then showering after that and then being ready for 2.30 calls, which I have clients at 2.30. So it's really important uh, to be able to, to make that. So this is, I'm giving a lot of detail and, and talking about these things that seem minor precisely because they're not, it's very easy for these seemingly little things not to be minor. And so for a, a very valuable routine to get easily dislodged. And so this really struck me as this is an example of something that I valued so much and the conditions changed. And until I re-engineered the routine to fit with the new conditions, I could, I was, I was missing out on this value. And then that has all sorts of um, other consequences. Another example, which I became aware of recently is I had this I had this ring called an aura ring, which is this very cool ring that I think is, takes a while to get a new one. And I, it, it tracks your sleep and it had really helped me be aware of my sleep. So it was this condition in my life where my phone would just tell me, Hey, this is how much you slept. And it made me, it got me better at getting to bed earlier. And I would just be aware um, and make little adjustments. And then I lost the ring and I just, and I thought, Oh, well, I've gotten in better habits, so I don't need to worry about it. And it's true. I had gotten in better habits. I go to bed earlier now than I did before. But for example, when I would wake up in the middle of the night, if I do, I realize my habits there would go down because I wouldn't, with the aura ring, I'd be aware of, hey, if you don't go to, try to go to bed quickly, then you're going to lose a bunch of time on this aura ring. Whereas I think, oh, well, maybe I'll just read something as long as I'm awake and then I'll go back to sleep kind of at my own pace. And then I might end up staying, for, staying up 45 minutes or an hour and that'll cut my sleep over time. So it's just this one little change of I didn't have this ring and then that made the routine that much harder. Uh, and, and then another one is with uh, my dog, Sherlock. And that's one where, now that's that's the one you might expect to be most uh, difficult. But I realized recently that there was just the way I was, when, when my girlfriend leaves the house, Sherlock uh, loves her the most, definitely. So he, he misses her and there's a certain transition period, at least right now, where he's transitioning for, to her being gone. And what I realized was I didn't have a really solid routine 
from that. So sometimes that transition would take a long time and I would end up getting distracted and I wouldn't do my work. And so, or I would, my, my work would really suffer for half an hour or an hour. And so what I started doing was just engineering, okay, what is exactly the best treat to give Sherlock to intrigue him? And then how do I, how can I work with him to do different kinds of tricks so that he gets uh, undistracted from the fact that she's gone and just these little things. And then how do I get him to sleep? And, and what's happened now is he has become much, much, a much better work uh, companion. And I'm not, I'm not treating him any worse, but I just have a streamlined routine so that I know, okay, for 10 or 15 minutes when she leaves, that's my time with Sherlock to work on that transition, but then he's going to be a pretty cool customer. Um, and then, and just that has, I mean, that's bought me at least an extra hour of a day. And, you know, when I got him, I wasn't, I knew on some level, yeah, it'll be, there'll be some friction, but in part because I didn't commit to trying to really engineer my life so like and have a better routine so that he fit well into my life and so that I could still get work done and have him it just led to certain kind of sloppiness and almost a fatalism like oh well now he's here so I'm not going to get this stuff done but really with some good engineering it got a lot better so giving you these examples and hoping that you can think of routines that you have in your life or that you have had in the past that have gotten disrupted by something seemingly small and then just think about and and usually in response to some change of conditions and then just think about how you can change conditions to re-engineer that routine and get it get it to work and then the same I, I mean the same things you're doing in re-engineering a routine you can also do to engineer a, a new routine so to think about okay what what changes of conditions can I have such that I create a good new um, type of routine. But what I, I find is there was a, a line, there's this a smart guy named Eben Pagan. I don't know if I've ever mentioned him on the show, but he's got, he's a kind of uh, entrepreneurial guru and has a very smart guy on a lot of topics. And I remember he had this, he had this great course called Altitude on, on growing a business. Um, but it was a very yeah, it was a very comprehensive course and gave a lot of good advice on a lot of things. And I remember early in the course, he had a discussion of, um, and the topic was things that you've done that have worked that you stopped doing. And I thought that's a great category. And I said, well, there's a surefire formula for failure is find out what works and then stop doing it. So with a good routine, if it works and I've stopped doing it, there's a lot of leverage in doing it again because it's really been uh, tested, but it does require this kind of re-engineering. So uh, interested in any kinds of uh, success or, or challenges that people have in re-engineering their own routines, feel free to share them on the Facebook page at facebook.com slash human flourishing project. Also, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. No response promised, but I do read all of the emails and I do appreciate them. Also, to get on our notification list, our email list, go to humanflourishingproject.com. Now, I'm no longer doing the show weekly, at least not weekly guaranteed, but I am essentially guaranteeing it uh, every other week. So I expect today, or this, this episode's coming out on the 9th, so I expect the ne uh, next one will come out on the 23rd, but if I have the inspiration, maybe there will be one on the 16th. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. I will speak to you in a couple weeks. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been the Human Flourishing Project.